Great. Well, uh, hello, everyone, and, uh, and welcome uh, to our session today. Uh, my name is Phil Arthurs. I'm the Director of Operations for Downsview Aerospace Innovation and Research. Um, on behalf of the entire DARE team, uh, I'd like to, to welcome you all to our joint webinar today uh, between DARE and uh, McMaster University. So we're very excited to be working with McMaster on this session today on green manufacturing and hearing from Bill and, and Dave. Um, and as we will discuss later, uh, Dare and McMaster are also exploring um, uh, the potential for additional sessions throughout 2023. And we're excited to share our thoughts uh, with you on that as well. For those that are not familiar with us, uh, Dare, uh, Downsview Aerospace Innovation and Research, is a not-for-profit consortium of industry and academics uh, building a world-leading aerospace innovation hub at Downsview Park in Toronto. And we also work to deliver initiatives, activities, and events to really push and promote collaboration uh, between large companies and small companies, between companies and academics, um, and across the spectrum of research and development, supplier development, um, and training. And so it's exciting to, to be partnering with McMaster on this very uh, important topic today. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite um, Ashin Correa from McMaster to come on and introduce uh, himself and our speakers for, uh, for the day. And then we'll get into our question and answer period a little bit later as well. So thanks very much. Enjoy the session and over to you, Ashin. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. It's a genuine pleasure to join you today. Uh, we were very excited at McMaster for undertaking this initiative and a variety in the future as well that we're very excited to discuss with the members here and gather your feedback. So really, we'll be looking at a uh, panelist discussion, uh, more so with uh, a few slides uh, from both speakers uh, that will be sharing insights, lessons learned, and best practices with regards to green manufacturing within the aerospace industry. So uh, before we get into the actual uh, content and the speakers, what I'm gonna do right now is uh, just go through a few housekeeping points. So the conduct will see myself an introduction of both speakers. Uh, we'll be going through uh, Dave Himes content first uh, and uh, Bill Matthews as well. There'll be of course, question and answer, general Q and A portion after that as well. If you have any questions throughout, feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, we'll have our administrator, Angela, who's on the call as well, keeping them in mind. And I'll certainly look to that as soon as we get to the Q&A portion. When you do have a, uh, a question you'd like to pose the both speakers, feel free to unmute uh, and um, show your camera as well. That's not a problem. If you'd like to directly ask them uh, during that conversation piece as well. Uh, so that's really the housekeeping points. Uh, on top of that, you've already seen the notice that this is being recorded. Uh, this will be open and I believe shared through the DARE uh, communication channels post the event. So certainly feel free to re reference it. Uh, the slides as well and the content will be available. Uh, and of course, uh, any questions, feel free to reach out to the DARE team and they will engage us uh, and we'll see what we can do to further enable any green manufacturing initiatives that each of you may be undertaking. So on that note, I'm just going to get everything situated for uh, the actual discussion. So I'll be pinning myself, uh, Bill Mattier and Dave Haim on the screen. And just to confirm, uh, Angela, on your end, are the three of us pinned for the recording purposes? Do you see each of, each of us? Okay. So if, Angela, for yourself, for the recording, if you can just pin uh, each of us, you may need to take off some of the pins once we get into the shared presentations when I share the screen, but I'll let you manage that. So uh, we'll move right into the introductions. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, it's a real genuine pleasure. Of course, whenever I get to interact with both Bill and Dave, uh, we've been getting to know each other over the last two years. Myself, uh, I lead the Industry Operations Leadership and Management Program at McMaster University. And through that initiative, I was able to uh, meet Dave so I'll take a very short excerpt to give a bit of his background. Uh, so Dave was the vice president of metals uh, for Boeing fabrication, which produces parts and assemblies uh, for Boeing commercial airplanes uh, and other business units. Uh, he was responsible for the strategy and operations of fabrication metals production uh, at several factories, employing more than 6,000 people. 
Uh, he was previously a general manager of Boeing Portland, uh, a role that included oversight of Boeing Helena, uh, Sheffield, uh, and Dave has also worked at Boeing Canada Winnipeg site in Saskatchewan. Uh, and he's also instructed high performance leadership fundamentals on McMaster's program. So Dave, thank you for taking the time to craft your presentation and join us today. Great. Well, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sean. And uh, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, participating in these events. And I just want to say hello to everyone. And it's it's quite exciting to talk about this um, this topic today. Uh, as Sean mentioned, uh, I spent 36 years at Boeing. Uh, my last assignment in the company was leading um, what we would call manufacturing business units. It's kind of how we're organized. Um, I had responsibility for all of those that uh, built or fabricated and assembled and delivered a lot of our large structural metallic components um, to the final assembly lines, kind of the internal supply chain to the company. And these were factories around North America and in Europe. But prior assignments, I actually led the Boeing Winnipeg site for five years and, you know, lived in Winnipeg. And, uh, you know, that site does um, uh, secondary composite structures, fairings and landing gear doors and things like that. And it was during that assignment that I really became um, focused, you know, on on uh, how we can be more sustainable in manufacturing. And, and I'll tell some stories about my time there and show a little bit of data. But uh, I think we can just go ahead and get into it here, Sean. And uh, Sure, I'm... and actually, Dave, just before that, uh, I'll just do a short introduction for Bill. Oh, sure. And then we'll get the introduction, uh, so that your slides up. So excellent. Uh, so Bill, as well as I got to know over the last two years, uh, Bill is a retired uh, senior executive with uh, the Bromont Cypher General Electric, and his career began with GE back in 1983 with GE aircraft engines at the Bromont Quebec site. During his 38 year career, he has held numerous leadership roles, including responsibilities as the VP of operations uh, and a GE uh, hydro, uh, sorry, the general manager for GE hydro global supply chain. And he serves as a member on numerous uh, boards of directors. Uh, he's also instructed business leaders on the, the McMaster's IOLM program on the topics of scaling and digitization of operations. So certainly, Bill, happy to have you with us as well. And thank you again. Oh, you're welcome, Ashen. Great to be here. Always enjoy the, the, the panel and the people that we interact with. Yeah, so uh, you know, Ashen gave us a quick overview. Uh, with GE, I've had the opportunity to go around the world uh, not only in the aviation industry, but in, in hydro, uh, multiple acquisitions around the world in Europe, uh, in Asia, and uh, South America, Brazil. So uh, you get to understand cultures and you know, what motivates people, and then how, how do we bring that into a concrete action? And you know, all the time, you know, Dave talked about 38 years, uh, 38 years for myself, different businesses, I was with Rolls-Royce for four years as well in Montreal. So you, you get to understand different business cultures and how, how do you bring you know, the, the notions of sustainability, uh, digitization, and really it comes down to evolution. How do we get people to feel comfortable in a dynamic workplace that is going to evolve over time and you know, go through uh, difficult periods like we had since 2020 and uh, hopefully all coming out of it uh, more sage, if you'd like, <laughs> and uh, willing to support other folks. So yeah, a little background on me. Perfect, great. Thanks again, Bill. Definitely looking forward to the insights both yourself and Dave are gonna share with uh, the audience members today. So on that note, Dave, I'm going to share my screen and I'll bring up the slides. I just wanna confirm with everyone, Angela, if you can give me a thumbs up that it's showing up, perfect. Uh, excellent. So at this point, Dave, I'll hand it over to you. And again, feel free to prompt me to cycle through the slides. Uh, and then we'll open it up for Bill's comments and any general Q&A. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I've just got a couple pages here uh, to show. Before I jump into it, though, I, I just want to, you know, share some of my experience. You know, I mentioned I led the Winnipeg site for uh, five years, and this was back around 2010. I was like 20, 2007 to 2012. Uh, and I really got interested and became, uh, you know, had a passion for 
sustainability. But one thing I can say, at least in Boeing, it'll be, I, I suspect Bill may have had the same experience, maybe we all have, but uh, the idea of sustainability at every level, I found it to be a unifying, you know, um, thought. It, it's not hard to get people interested in sustainability, at least in our company, in, in Boeing, everyone can agree that we ought to have more sustainability. So I think from uh, the perspective of, of creating motivation to do better, uh, it's really a, a common, I, I found it to be a common passion among our teams. So first, I just wanted to show you like the larger Boeing strategy around sustainability. And then I'm going to get into a little bit more specifics around manufacturing and, you know, my experiences in manufacturing. But, you know, Boeing's got really four pillars of sustainability. Uh, just quickly from left to right, you know, fleet renewal is a big part of it. You know, the newer airplanes that we produce now, you know, are on the order of 15 to 20 percent more fuel efficient. Uh, they use less chemicals in their production. Uh, we've driven recycling, uh, and I'll show you a little more on that, um, on how to handle you know, an airframe when it reaches the end of its life. So fleet renewal is substantial as far as reducing carbon footprint. Operational efficiency, uh, this is really helping the airlines optimize the use of these assets with, um, you know, better digital tools to understand uh, how to really use this airplane in a way that reduces carbon footprint. Uh, renewable energy is a is a big one, and I think most of the thrust here is in sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, for the last ten years, we've had various uh, airplanes that we call eco demonstrators, and uh, the latest one is a triple seven that we're running biofuels, and you know demonstrating that you can operate an airplane on biofuels. Uh, so you know sustainable aviation fuels is is key, and even on the far right, then some of the advanced technology around, um, you know, the, the lower right hand picture where you've got electrification. Uh, we've got that now on what will probably become the, the future, like the air taxi of the future. Uh, we've got a joint venture with a company called WISC that we're really figuring out how would that work and probably more importantly when you're talking about an air taxi and, and an electric airplane helping our regulators understand, you know, what's it mean to go certify something like this, you know? So there's quite a bit of investment going on here in the company, but that's kind of a larger view. We've got a chief sustainability officer in the company that reports to our CEO. That position has only existed now for about three years. So definitely a seat at the table with our board of directors and our executive council. Um, just wanted to kind of share the broader picture. So if we just page down, Sean, I'll get into a little bit more now about manufacturing. Uh, yeah, right here. So if, if you think about, uh, um, we got factories all over the place and I, you know, I led like nine of them. My last assignment was leading uh, nine or so of these factories around, um, the, around the U.S. and in Europe. And uh, I'll just describe kind of what that was like. You know, the top left text there just talks about how we embed sustainability at Boeing. You know, we make it part of employee safety and well-being, you know, having a, a sustainable product, a sustainable factory, uh, all of those things that improve, you know, what we're providing for our customers, but also improve the experience we're having, the community we work in environmentally responsible operations are good for our employees and good for the community. We spend a lot of time in the community uh, improving the environment. It's part of our community outreach. You know, we have uh, within the company just all kinds of ways of engaging in community outreach. Uh, we participate broadly around global aerospace safety, innovation, clean technology. So those are the fundamental principles. Uh, if you move to the right, then uh, some of kind of where we are now on on clean energy, we've got, you know, large factories, our final assembly line in Renton, Washington, Charleston, South Carolina, that picture on the lower left is a aerial view of our 787 final assembly line in Charleston, you can see the solar panels on the top of the final assembly building. 
Uh, all of these, these large sites now are running on 100% renewable energy. That's our goal broadly, but we've achieved it in these, in these areas. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about recycling, but you know, now that we've got carbon fiber airplanes with the 787, and that's really the future of our airplanes, we've invested a lot in how to recycle that material. Uh, that's, I think, a good opportunity for, for us to further do research on how can we really utilize this excess carbon material, because we're going to consume more and more. Uh, all of our employees sign a code of conduct, you know, that talk about sustainability as an aspect of that. And, and then we've got a permanent aerospace safety committee that uh, oversees this. And, and then there's like a report card there, the lower right. That's an example, like me as a, as a business unit leader in the company, this was part of my report card around greenhouse gas emissions, energy. I had to report every month to my uh, leader and then quarterly up through the executive council of the company. How am I doing on these various dimensions of sustainability? You know, and we've got goals against 2025 and then goals against 2025 to 2030 and so on. So these are metrics that are managed and tracked daily, weekly, monthly, you know, inside the company for how we operate our factories. We've had some pretty good performance. Uh, you know, the caveat here is when you look at 2021, we had reduced production given COVID and so on. So there's a little bit of uh, math we do here to really understand is the improvement uh, production related or actual improvement related. And, you know, we're definitely tracking to the to the goals we've set. We, of course, want to overachieve on those, but uh, pretty proud of where we are, certainly around solid waste. And I'll talk a bit more about that in the next page. And hazardous waste, too. You know, and, uh, in, in the area of hazardous waste, things like um, we've stopped the use of chromium. We, we would chrome plate some of our high wear parts. Uh, we're now using a zinc nickel plating, which is much more friendlier to the environment. That's one example, things like that, that require some innovation on how we can manufacture these products. If we page down then, uh, Sean. Sure, David. Actually, uh, just a quick question, a thought. Yeah. You just actually mentioned that these attributes of sustainability were actually part of your report card. As a yeah, they are, leader. yeah. Yeah, you know, Absolutely. I have a balance, you know, I'd have a, a report card that talks about cost, quality, delivery, safety, you know, the main aspects of running any business, but uh, sustainability was one of those um, same level of, of uh, right. uh, scrutiny on my KPIs, you know, and I would stand up in front of leadership and talk about how we're doing, just like I would quality or delivery or cost, I would talk about this as well, so... So it's really interesting you mentioned that because in some of the discussions, even with the business leaders we've had through the program, when it comes to the floor management system itself, right, driving these dashboards and KPIs right to the department and floor level, did you see any initiatives that really pushed either environmental, sustainability, even circular economy, uh, KPIs or actions through the floor management system? Or did you find it was better uh, through a design project aspect held through those um, other entities? Yeah, you know, I think if you look at this set of, uh, of KPIs, it, it kind of varies, you know, to the degree we can break down the consumption to a, like a shop floor work cell level, we would do that. And we're able to do that in the areas of solid waste and hazardous waste. Uh, things like water and energy are more like at a factory level. It's harder to get that broke down, broken down to an individual work cell. So uh, what we would do then, we would expect like as a frontline manager, they would have understanding of their solid waste and their hazardous waste. And we would expect that they would oh, have okay. a plan to improve. Um, they would, you know, at a factory level, we would have understanding of our water consumption and energy consumption. So we would maybe more like at a factory leadership team level, we would come up with countermeasures. How can we improve in the use of water and the use of energy and things like, you know, one example in the use of energy where we're going to go relight the whole factory with LED, you know, though, though that's an example of a of a tactic we used in energy consumption, you know, and water consumption, really, it's, it's understanding where is all the water going now, you know, how, how do, how is it used? And where does it go? 
And as you can understand that better, then you know you bring ideas forward. Well, how might we reduce? Can we recycle it more? What can we do here? So that's one example of of how. And then the greenhouse gas emission is almost like a result. You know, we convert these improvements into how much did we save? You know, how many tons of carbon did we save right. by all of these tactics? You know, so it's like a kind of a lagging KPI, whereas some of these others are more leading you know if you can improve energy water solid waste hazardous waste then you should see a corresponding improvement in greenhouse gas emissions uh, for example so that's kind of how we engaged okay Great. yeah thanks i'll uh, bring up the next slide here as well yeah and this is my, my last page here so you know, I talked a little bit about recycling. You know, I wanted to point this out. Um, we really have a, a high aspiration to make sure a, an airframe is fully recyclable, you know, at the end of its life. So you know, we're at a point now where around 90% of a commercial airplane can be recycled uh, for parts reuse and scrap, you know, and that includes our aluminum airplanes. Uh, what we had to go do when we introduced composite airplanes on the 787, we really had to develop what's now become a whole new supply chain for uh, recycled composite materials. And the map there you see of the U.S. and it includes Winnipeg. And, you know, I mentioned I was in Winnipeg when we really got this going because we use a lot of uh, uh, carbon fiber material in Winnipeg. And I was a part of this, you know, more than 10 years ago to get this started was how do we develop a, a supply chain for our excess, both cured and uncured? Uh, cured was an easier problem to solve initially, but we also have uncured uh, scrap material that we were uh, finding ways to recycle. And uh, if you look at the lower right-hand picture now, you know that's just some examples of how we've worked with different industries and you know academia to figure out how can we take this these carbon fiber scrap pieces and turn them into something useful you know a lot of it goes into automotive uh, golf clubs you know different uses of you know where you don't you start out with aerospace grade material but the scrap can then be used for you know more like uh, industrial uses where it really can be uh, effective um, so you know we got more than a million pounds of this now going through this recycling supply chain as opposed to into landfills and uh, coming from these sites here. And then the last thing I want to mention is um, within the manufacturing process, this is a picture of two mechanics um, making an interior panel, you know, like a sidewall that you would see inside the airplane. One of the business units I led in the past was one that designed and built all the interior. So everything, when you walk onto a Boeing airplane, everything you see inside the airplane, this business unit designed and built out. And uh, kind of like our Winnipeg site, it's a hand layup process where you you know start with some honeycomb core and some pre-preg you know, carbon fiber sheets and you lay those together and you have to put a plastic bag on top because you're going to draw a vacuum uh, to compress that so it can then be cured in an oven and for years this plastic bag was a one use you know get that panel cured and done and then you throw the plastic bag in the landfill so you know one of the innovations and this happens just at the factory floor level is you know why don't we use a, re a, re a reusable bag you know so that's what they're uh, depicting here is just a you know, piece of material like a poly that you can put onto the part, tape it down, draw a vacuum, put it in an oven, get it cured, and then you you just use it again and again and again. You know, so we're not uh, throwing away. And you can imagine at scale how much plastic we threw away every day uh, when we're building you know interior parts for our entire product line. So these are the kind of the simple local solutions that can be done and. What we've tried to do with our workforce is really incentivize this, you know, we make it fun, you know, can we create some competition, you know, between factories or between departments, what can you think about or what can you do within your area of control that is just a little bit better from a sustainability perspective. So, you know, this example around not throwing away a lot of plastic was a big one. The other one that was significant was as we receive 
products from our supply chain um, that we buy to go into our assemblies, the amount of dunnage and packaging and whatnot that goes into that is is significant you know so we were having all kinds of you know mountains you can just imagine mountains and mountains of dunnage that we were removing and so we've worked out these processes where we create like uh, rotable containers like i don't know, like milk crates almost in one example and these things are cycling back and forth to our supply chain they there's we have packaging engineers that design these reusable containers and you know, it turns out that, well, we're not throwing away a lot of dunnage, but also the parts are better protected because it's a, it's a purpose designed container that you can, you know, send these parts back and forth between the supply chain and us. So uh, the vast majority of our supply chain, at least within the U.S. now is on like a milk run where we're, these things are constantly rotating and we've you know cut in half, at least in half the amount of dunnage and the amount of labor it goes to undo all that stuff too so it really benefits you on less landfill reusable containers uh, less labor to unpack you know more it's safer because it's purpose designed you're not bending deep into a box to get a part out it's like this specifically designed container and so on so really at the very cell level local level we found that to be very effective so it gets everyone involved all the way up and down the organization so i think i'll stop there sean just to make sure we stay on schedule but uh yeah happy to take a question or even at the end if we want to do it then sure yeah so definitely some very resonating points uh first the top-down approach you mentioned right from your dashboard your reports i'm very happy to hear that attributes were pushed through the floor management system right to the front uh, line workers uh especially the frontline worker engagement so it's really shaping the cultural piece it's really interesting to see a practical application from a circular economy aspect as well in essence uh, all the other parts moving into other industries and supporting the sustainable uh, initiatives within those other businesses and, and uh, industries as well so very interesting uh, points bill i'll hand it over to you for any thoughts uh, or practices you'd like to share on this what dave just shared with us yeah, a lot of uh, common practice, if you would like. Uh, you know, what Dave mentioned clearly resonates uh, with respect to shipping. Uh, we went exactly through the same process as we, we call them rotables, where the product leaves our leaves the factory, goes down to the central distribution area in the U.S., and comes back again in a knockdown form. And you know, we saw a lot of gains with respect to quality uh so parts going down not being damaged so the, you know there is things of that nature and i i believe that if you're looking at it more from a factory floor point of view it's the engagement of the folks what are we doing how are we doing it uh if you connect that to the area that you're living in uh you know more of my last assignment was uh, a smaller town clearly that they have to manage the water resources. So it's a town that's growing, you know, with ski industry, uh, a lot of high tech IBM, et cetera, in our area, but we need to be able to have net zero water consumption. So how do we, right. all of the, yeah, we have a wastewater treatment plant, all of the effluent is treated and must be returned to the city uh, better, well, in essence, we at least tout that, that what we receive, we monitor coming in and what we send out, the the stats are better uh, and tied to uh, the Quebec norms for water going out. So a, lo a lot of things like that are, are, are very important, but getting people on the shop floor to understand yeah. what they do every day is important. So uh, very excellent points and very interesting to see the engagement with especially the local municipalities and driving their sustainable initiatives. I'll introduce this thought right now, but we'll come back to it later, especially with the, it sounds like a heightened need to interact with subject matter experts, especially in the sustainability space, uh, government entities, other industries. So the one thought coming into mind is a design thinking approach in terms of that level of collaboration. So I'll park that for now, but I'd love to come back to 
you know, how overt were those um, initiatives at both Boeing and GE to engage external experts um, and uh, enablers to drive these initiatives. So I'll just park that for now, but it sounds okay. like it's at the heart of, you know, the change management approach we're talking about. So Bill, on that note, I'll share your presentation here and I'll hand it over to you. You should be able to see it now. Yeah, I do see it. Let, oh, you can just jump to the content, Ashen, if you would. Sure. Now, next page, please. There we go. Sure. So trying to, what I wanted to do is give some actual uh, hands-on, if you would like, photos of what was done in the drive towards sustainability. So back in 2015, if we look on the right-hand side, uh, where my pointer is or my cursors currently, uh, that was when the expansion took place and there was a mass balance calculation done. So this specific plant uh, produces airfoils for, uh, you know, which is nice having, have, having Dave here is the direct partnership we had with Boeing. So on the 737, 767, uh, 787, 747, producing engines for uh, Boeing. But there, we did a mass balance calculation where, in essence, you know, I'm, I, this probably is going to drive it down to the lowest common denominator. But in essence, this plant is a giant machine shop, if you would take it in, in that context. So doing a mass balance calculation with the number of machines in the expansion area, what was required uh, with these solar panels that really uh, what they do is they absorb, so this is a south facing plant, it absorbs the sunlight and preheats the air going in to reduce the consumption of uh, natural gas uh, to heat the plant itself. So uh, an efficiency down to, as I uh, indicated, uh, zero Celsius will still be able to, to heat the plant. And the sizing was based on the amount of heat generated by the actual machine tools and the robots and this, the, all of the equipment in the plant. And then if we flip across, if you'd look here, uh, you have the uh, sort of the front view of the plant. Uh, on the extreme left of the photo, you'll see the building is white. So that was back in about 2015. I took this photo uh, last week. So this is a new solar panel system. Uh, that also has been implemented to augment and offset uh, greenhouse gases or the use of natural gas in the heating of the facility. And you know, one thing that's important when we talk, Ashen mentioned, uh, you know, relationships with the municipalities, also having a relationship with uh, the uh, provincial government and the natural gas providers, where they were definitely on board to support us in the reduction of consumption of the natural gas. So uh, there's an ROI of about three years on those systems based on the offset to natural gas and the amount of money they gave us in the grant. Otherwise, uh, if you were going in purely on the company's dime, it would be about a 10 year offset uh, to get to uh, your cash flow. Right. And and when then what, when we talk about engagement of people, so uh, we have, in the physical plant, we have boilers. And so these boilers, uh, the, the technicians were challenged on what can we do to, uh, uh, to preheat the feed water in order to reduce the energy consumption again uh, to bring the boiler up to temperature. And what you see, and you know, these are the best shots I could get, unfortunately, folks. But on the extreme left, the the actual chimney conduits have been totally insulated, and there is a tubing wrapped around the chimneys that actually extracts the heat. And there's a water jacket that pumps it, and that's used in a heat exchanger to offset the cold water coming in as feed water. So again. Uh, but this was driven also by the engineers and the the, uh, the boiler operators who said, look, it, it sounds a bit far-fetched, but some industries are doing it. And again, we were able to pick up uh, some credits and some dollars, keeping those relationships open with external funding sources. 
So, uh, you know, a lot of fun from that perspective. And, you know, the other opportunities, and I know Dave mentioned it, but, you know, plant-wide and parking-wide LED relamping. You know, we went through the whole cycle of, you could imagine, incandescent to mercury to sodium, then to LED. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of good returns uh, on that. And again, working with Hydro-Quebec, they were more than willing to step up and uh, put some money on the table to increase the, uh, the payback or to decrease the payback period uh, for those projects. And, you know, that, a little nitty gritty, you, you know, might find it a little bit amusing, but, you know, the physical plant people were talking with the cafeteria folks. Uh, we're having a lot of problems with the ventilation they, uh, from the kitchen cooking area where there was a heat exchanger. The heat exchanger would become covered in grease. There was a lot of problems. So they put in place a, a ventilation upgrade that met the new standard for uh, cafeterias, as well as variable speed ventilation to uh, reduce the amount of makeup air required to, to heat the cafeteria and the kitchen area. So again, this is coming from a, a shop floor perspective. Right, right. No, very interesting. I'll, I'll go to the next slide shortly, Bill, but I also found it interesting. We're seeing this a lot on Canadian sites, the vertical implementation of solar cells on the sites. I'm, I'm assuming it's more driven by the environmental factors. Uh, did you see that uh, any sort of uh, seasonal impacts throughout the year, or was it pretty consistent? I will see. Yeah, obviously, like what we were picking up was you know getting a good lift uh, since it goes down to zero C for the winter period. That wow. that that was uh, you know positive seasonality. Uh, the challenge we found with the the new level of uh, insulation, uh, and also as I mentioned, the mass balance calculations for the equipment inside was. The, it was a, a challenge to, to start cooling the facility. So, oh, we the other, <laughs> so we had a bit of a summer offset, and I'll, I'll try to explain that on the other, uh, the other slide. Sure. Oops. Go back here. There we go. Yeah. So what you will see, I, you know, trying to, you know, it was a, a great segue there, uh, Ashton. So the seasonal, you know, even looking at it from a seasonal process water cooling, uh, in the summer, we ran into uh, a situation where trying to keep the process water cool just with a simple cooling tower wasn't really effective. And what we had to do at that point in time was offset with city water, which you know obviously wasn't a, a desirable approach. So got the P&E, so the required investment to put in chillers. And, and now what we've got is if you'd look you'll see uh, two red end plates. Mm -hmm. So what the team came up with was, well, we don't wanna run the chillers necessarily all year round because they're you know, like there's 350 horsepower electric motors to run these chillers. So in the, uh, the winter season, these are shut off. In the summer, they're turned on and we do a flip-flop uh, back and forth through a heat exchanger to optimize and it's computer controlled to really keep the minimum consumption of energy, electricity, and to keep the water at a consistent temperature. So uh, again, bringing in some outside experts because we obviously don't have necessarily the, that expertise in the plant, uh, that actually did uh, go a long way to help us reduce, again, uh, even electricity consumption, in spite of the fact that in Quebec, obviously we have some of the lowest electricity prices in uh, North America. If we look at the other side going towards the right is uh, high efficiency condensing water heaters. Uh, back in the day, so the plant's uh, sort of an 83 vintage, uh, had all these old, you can imagine just like at home, standard water heaters all over the place. And we pulled this into one area with multiple condensing water uh, heaters that allowed us to really reduce the amount of electricity consumed, the, the waste, as well as having a more uniform temperature for both process as well as uh, domestic use. And on the other side, you see 
so, so again, we have multiple processes. If folks on the uh, on the panel are uh, aware of like peening operations for stress relief, so using high consumption of compressed air, uh, and this is throughout the different areas in the plant, and given that all of these operations are really based on where the process, where the parts are in the process, a high degree of variability. So rather than having a small number of compressors that uh, run on an on-off concept, uh, recompre reintroduce new compressors with variable speed drives that allow and adjust, they maintain the pressure, but reduce uh, the energy consumption by only providing what is required flow by, uh, as the operations come on and off. So they would cascade the compressors on and off. Again, electricity uh, also helps uh, reduce some of the heating uh, required. So th that's what you'd see more at a, P a plant and equipment side. But uh, as Dave mentioned, then we got into the process waste reduction. So uh, part of the intrinsic processes uh, of uh, this facility, they use chem milling. So in other words, to do a uniform milling of material off of a product. And you know we have to face uh, the water treatment challenge and how to go about neutralizing. And it's a flocculation-based type of water treatment plant. But what we started to look at, well, rather than shipping, if you'd like, these acids or ferric <clears throat> chloride offsite to an external source, to be treated and disposed of, uh, came up with a internal process that we can use our waste stream products to introduce into the wastewater treatment plant that reduces new chemical consumption, uses these acids to have a balanced waste treatment process that I mentioned that the water return to the city is actually directly and dead on to what uh, the provincial norms are. And this was, uh, I mean, let me be quite frank, this was a, a project that took close to eight years to really hone in and have it working properly. But now uh, when you would see what Dave presented with the amount of reduction, so we're, you know, that plant was also tracked on the improvements it made environmentally and sustainability. But the other element was as well, the engagement of the folks is the, the facility, you know, before 2020 was about 900 people. So to, to get all those minds engaged in, in this sustainability and attaching that to the notion of health and safety. So yeah, the environment, but also the health and safety of each one of the uh, operators, which, you know, let me transition to the next topic around, uh, you know, water-based cutting fluids. So as you as you go on to that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, for uh, a gross image of being a, a giant machine shop, uh, a lot of cutting fluids were used. And again, uh, we're talking a project that has you know lasted quite a while. We do a lot of exotic metals, so the machining is quite between the cutting tools and the type of fluids you use for cutting. But we have been able to introduce the water-based and the advantage of the water-based products is any of the effluent we can treat in the water treatment plant where with oils, we weren't equipped to treat oils. It was sent off site. And also when you're dealing with titanium, uh, when you're doing the machining of that, the best environment you have fire su uh, suppression. And we've done multiple experiments where in spite of the best fire suppression, using oil-based coolants for the cutting tools, you do still have a risk of an ignition. So going to the water-based took, uh, took away that potential risk. And I guess just to wrap up quickly, uh, just general consideration, uh, making sure that everyone reaches out to the energy providers, to the government to understand what programs are available and then if I want, just loop back to engagement of folks, you know, mm -hmm. the, we got the lean waste treasure hunt, uh, you know, simple things like a leak in an air hose. Well, you don't just get used to hearing it hiss. 
you lift, lift up your hand, you engage with people to get it corrected. Uh, so, uh, you know, I can't talk uh, really mention enough about how we get people engaged and they start raising their hands saying, well, look, this is happening. Can I have some support to make it go away? So, right. you know, that, that's really what I wanted to share with the, uh, with the team. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, very definitely appreciate the specific examples as well, but and the interaction with third parties. Dave mentioned interactions with other industries and businesses. It's interesting to hear about the municipal engagement, the governmental engagement as well. So I think you both certainly worked well to share insight into the question I had. But at this point, I'll open it up to any questions uh, from the audience that members would like to pose to either Bill or Dave. Feel free to unmute. Uh, and your camera as well, if you'd like, and or drop your questions uh, or comments in the chat. So we'll open it up now before we go into sharing some of the initiatives uh, we're in discussions with Dara as well on. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to pose at this time? Hi, um, I have a question. Um, hi, Fatima. Yes. Hi, I'm Fatima. I'm a PhD student in uh, under chemical engineering. I'm a second year PhD student. And I'm doing research in um, sustainable aviation fuels. So I had a question for Dave. Um, it was a really nice talk. I know um, it was nice to hear what's happening at Boeing, but I wanted to hear a bit more about the sustainable aviation fuels and how much, how does that look like from an investment perspective? Like, is it very costly? Do you think that it will last long term? Do you think it will really help um, achieve achieving the climate change goals? And yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, thanks, Fatima. That's a great question. You know, we, as I mentioned, we've been uh, really investing a lot in sustainable aviation fuel development for probably more than 10 years. And we've used these eco demonstrator airplanes. And, you know, I'd say the first portion of that was to solve the technical problems. You know, how do you you know, make sure that an airplane can consume biofuels and have the performance necessary for it to do its mission. And I think we've solved that, you know. Uh, the, the next phase, one we're in now, is how do we really uh, address, I think the term that I've heard a lot is the green premium. Can you remove the green premium to where it's more expensive? How do you incentivize companies, airlines, to use sustainable aviation fuel, uh, can you make it, you know, cost neutral with fossil fuels? And I think the answer is we can do that, you know, and that's really where we are today is how do you, one, build scale on sustainable aviation fuels? And when, when as you're doing that, then ensure that the cost becomes neutral or maybe better. And I think it could even come better than, than fossil fuels. So, I have great optimism. I think sustainable aviation fuel is going to really be significant uh, in aerospace uh, as we go forward. And, and that's really where the work is happening now. I think we've solved for the technology and how, how can it operate. And now it's more about scale and cost, get that cost down, increase that scale is where we are. So it's a significant effort inside Boeing and, and across, you know, many uh, industries and governments and so on to develop this. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree with what you said because I've read a lot about it and I feel like right now literature is saturated with lots of reviews and process comparisons and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, I think if we focus on the cost perspective, um, we can really advance with these fuels. But yeah, thank you very much. Sure, that was a nice you. talk. Perfect. And we have one question from Mohammed in the chat. Uh, in essence, to the embedding of sustainability, what kind of assets can we attain from community engagement? And what was done before going out, uh, so on to reach out to the community? So um, Bill, maybe I'll hand that over to you. It sounds more about what's the best initial strategies when you're looking to engage these external stakeholders to jointly uh, work on sustainable initiatives? Perhaps you can share some insight for Mohammed. Well, I, I was on uh, uh, the board of, well, they call it SODEB in, in Bromont. So it's the uh, uh, Develop Industry, Industry Think Group for the Industrial Park. 
and it really came from the city and the, the city came to us with two oh they came to this group with two proposals one they they'd been over to europe and looked at some of these green if, if you'd like if you if you look at mercedes or audi uh, a volkswagen when you look at the complexes that they run or they have trees and trees inside the building, and they really developed an eco center around manufacturing. Uh, the city, uh, the city of Bromont, wanted to go in the same direction, uh, so that brought that to the table from the city, as well as with the growth uh, with the growth of uh, residential uh, and the consumption of water based on the residential increase. Uh, how could we all uh, on the industrial side be net zero consumption? So we always recycle what we consume. And, and that was the, you know, if you'd like the introduction to getting things kicked off and having the focus. But I can tell you back in the uh, 80s, uh, I'll sort of date myself, we had those type of uh, initiatives uh, with the uh, environmental groups. What, what can we do? to reduce the consumption, gases, you know, it was, uh, uh, it's nothing new. So I make reference to 40 years, while well, it's really like 40 years in uh, development, 40 years of hard work to drive towards that. So Sounds those good. type of initiatives, it, they need to be embedded. I think Dave, you know, uh, typified it properly where it, it, it's corporate looking at being a better corporate citizen and how to drive sustainability uh, across their businesses. So right. uh, from that perspective, uh, it's really being having that engagement. Right, and I think both of you have mentioned this as well, right down to change management. It's not just about those individual engagement activities, but you're talking about cultivating and growing a relationship with all these stakeholders, and it's an ongoing conversation. So I think it's an and excellent uh, discussion. I might uh, jump George, in there just uh, George, just just real quick. Oh, sorry. Please, I was just going to no, make 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 mention, and I think it's it's such an interesting conversation where we're talking all these different stakeholders, and I know we have a lot um, of the smaller and medium sized companies on the line, and and we engage uh, our, ourselves at Dare and, and McMaster and others with these these SMEs. So, you know, your 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 concept is about engaging with the governments, the local communities, the the subject matter experts. Um, but I, I think, and maybe you know, Dave or Bill, you could just speak quickly, you know, to the engagement that that the large companies have with the supply chain uh, for some of these these key concepts, and you know how they kind of um, cascade down to the supply chain, and, and some of those KPIs might be pushed to the to the suppliers uh, in in a Boeing or GE, and uh, and just kind of this holistic approach to green and sustainability that involves the entire supply chain. So. I just thought I would throw that out. Maybe, maybe Dave, you could speak to that quickly. Well, you know, it's uh, it's a great question, and I, you know, I think it's um, as I look at the what we're up against here and what we're trying to solve for. I'm very optimistic that we can innovate solutions to the problem. You know, and as I just observe across Boeing, it's happening every day in every factory. And I think a challenge, though, that we can maybe all agree and accept would be. How do you scale that? You know, how is how do you make it easier, even within the same organization? Boeing's a big company. Even within the nine factories I led, oftentimes I would find an innovation in one that this other factory didn't know about. You know, so how do you cultivate uh, an environment where you sort of know what you know? You know, that that knowledge can be be moving horizontally, uh, not just within a company, but between companies? How do we scale this innovation? And maybe that's an opportunity or a challenge we can all take on is, I think there's, the one thing I just think about more than anything is, is not that we can't solve the problem, it's that we can't scale the solution fast enough, you know? So that's kind of where I've been spending time and maybe through what you're doing at DARE, or Sean, you know, this uh, idea of, of, of some work at McMaster on how do we bring people together and really imagine methods to scale the innovation quicker than we've been doing. Yeah, and, yeah. and dealing with, yeah, you mentioned Ashton around, uh, you know, culture change. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, trying to break down the walls of NIH, so not invented here. 
because you know it might be good for you guys but it's no good for us because you know we're different it's you know having those conversations so the you know the plant that i led was one of nine and how do we have those conversations just throwing out the you know the different ideas and you know breaking down some of the resistance so yeah, if you yeah. invented a good one will you give me one i'll give you one rather than me having to invent two and you having to invent two that are the same and right. you know those discussions change management are are always quite interesting and understanding the knock-on effect you know when you looked at sustainable fuels and you know how, how do we derive ethanol from corn well there's all sorts of ways to do it but the price of cornmeal to make tacos in Mexico went through the roof and people couldn't eat. Right. So it's really having that mass balance. So what is the effect of what we're trying to do and how do we scale it without causing a problem somewhere else? Of course. No, absolutely. Great. Really great insights. Uh, what I'll do right now, because I'm cognizant of the time. So Joanne, I believe you have a question. So we'll have you pose your question and then we'll quickly go over the three initiatives we'd like to spread the word on here and gather your feedback. And I'll hand it over to Phil for our closing comments. So Joanne, uh, I'll hand it over to you for your question, please. Sure. Uh, my question has to do with, you know, if we've done the basics, we've done the LED, we've done the motion sensor detections, we've done mm -hmm. All the basics, uh, you know, as a as a good uh, corporate citizen uh, should. How do we go to the next level? Because we do have manufacturing facilities in Germany, and based on what was discussed, Germany is light years ahead in terms of green technology, in terms of really integrating uh, sustainable manufacturing into everyday life. And so we've learned a lot from our you know headquarters of things that we could be doing better uh, in our facilities here in Brampton. The problem though, is the government has not standardized these uh, technologies. They have not recognized them. They don't recognize how it works, why it works. Nobody in Canada has implemented them before. So we're really kind of stuck. You know, we can do the basics, but we'd like to do more. We'd like to advance. And it seems very difficult. So the question really is, um, you know, can companies like Boeing and GE lead the charge and say, you know what, we've got some suppliers that can do this, what's stopping them? And and perhaps push the envelope a little bit here. You know, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, comment on that. I, you know, that's, I think you're uh, illustrating a common struggle, you know, that uh, we all face. And uh, it's a multi-dimensional thing you know so you know where we operate we're engaged with the local municipalities the government to really in some cases skill them up as to what we're doing or they might skill us up as to what we're doing it sounds like in your case it's bringing them along you've got some great practices used in your germany facility that you could replicate there but helping your government see that i i think just bringing them in you know you, maybe you take them to look at the germany factory just to elevate their understanding i think is part of the process bringing them along you know and uh I think also uh, inside the company, what really made a difference in Boeing was was putting some structure in place that drove accountability to performance. Like I mentioned, I, I led several factories, and I had a scorecard that I had to report on every month with my boss. You know how I'm doing against these kind of macro um, metrics of green, you know, as well. So I think having some structure at every level, whether it's the shop floor senior leadership, middle management, a little bit of structure such that we drive progress um, is, is important, you know, make, making it a, a critical business metric, I'll say. You probably, maybe you do that now, but uh, I found that was a pivotal point for us. And then uh, I think it's back to this, um, bringing more people together, you know, to get us all on the same page so that we help each other scale this. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to do that. And uh, right now it feels like we're kind of in our own, we're fighting this battle by ourselves, you know, but if we can somehow, maybe through these initiatives, you'll talk about us, Sean, bring more people together, it can, we can become more efficient at that, you know, so. Like from the Montreal perspective, if you'd like, I was on the board of the Aero Montreal 
which is recruitment. So we would have uh, Bombardier. Uh, we've got you know all all of the local hub uh, for aviation, and they have a, a yearly, you know, let's get out of the office and let's hit some of the best practices, and but also inviting government officials, you know, literally getting them out of their office where they're stuck in, you know, all right, you know, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll discount <laughs> electricity so it'll all be better again. And, and really having that discussion. But the other piece that's important, I'll talk specifically for the aircraft engine perspective, is the architecture. If you'd look at one of the photos on the first page, I believe, in the strategy Dave showed, you've got the equivalent of an uninducted fan. And on the engine, but the components within the engine, so to improve sustainability, reduce consumption, whether it be sustainable, you name it, fuels, the architecture is changing. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to have that bell ringing in the facilities where, in essence, if we don't understand what the new architecture is coming towards us, a lot of these factories uh, and all of the P&E, the equipment, will not be serviceable for what the new designs are going to be. So people need to understand the world is going to change. You know, yeah, I'd imagine yeah. from Dave's perspective, no, we're always going to make aluminum fuselage. Oh, no, no, now it's carbon fiber. Well, what about the guys that were rolling the aluminum? Oh, sorry, guys. So we've got the same thing going on the, uh, the engine side where we really need to get that cross pollination happening. It, it, I mean, your point is very valid, Joan, and sometimes I mean, you can see why Dave and I have no hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Really, really interesting points. And Joan, a very interesting question. I think it's a good segue into the initiative we're looking to ideate right now. We'd love the feedback from members uh, on the call as well. So I'm just going to share my screen here. And this is a, uh, a, a initiative we are discussing with Adair and McMaster. So we would just love feedback to gather um, in points and just ideate over potential stakeholders on what this might look like. Uh, and if it's something that we're looking to launch, we'll happily uh, spread the word on that as well. And really, if this was a, a green manufacturing event series. We're looking at really the same members that are on the call right now, leadership members, cross-functional teams within uh, SMEs, uh, OEMs, the tier one suppliers, absolutely. Anyone who's really involved within the uh, aerospace manufacturing state. Uh, the aim will be to obviously share best practices, lessons learned, insight to help enable those businesses and organizations that we've discussed. One thing that's fundamental to this approach is that we're, we're thinking about a design thinking methodology in, embedded into the, the three single day type event. So what do I mean by that? Day one will be a discussion on some general topics, some specific examples, much like uh, both Dave and Bill just mentioned. Uh, and what we would look to do is we would have uh, industry speakers. So this initiative, much like the uh, courses offered under the McMaster Certificates of Completion, are all industry led. So we're looking at the senior leaders from around the world joining, uh, speaking about their uh, initiatives and content. But we're going to be breaking into groups, cross-functional groups led by a facilitator to really bring to light some of those key innovations, challenges, or opportunities. And the idea being over day two and day three, you'll be able to further invite other members within your engineering teams, methods, facilities, or government stakeholders, uh, or other business leaders when it comes to the circular economy aspect. And we'll be able to further dive into potential solutions. Our job would be to bring together the speakers and the content to help tailor, especially over day two and day three so that we have a much more tailored approach and an opportunity to allow all these different stakeholders to come together. And we're really thinking on the international footprint here as well. So uh, the first day, approximately maybe mid-February, March, and maybe one in July, this is an idea that we are talking about right now. And what I'll do is in the chat, I'm gonna drop a link for a Google form here. And really it's just, if you are interested, in learning more about this, if we come to fruition in it, uh, feel free to fill out the form. 
part of it also is a section on what are the topics that you would like us to look at as well. That feedback is really going to help us share that uh, content. So if you have a few uh, minutes and you'd like to keep in touch on uh, this initiative, if uh, we're able to launch it, that would be great. It's really the, at the ideation stage right now. So that's really the green manufacturing state. I'm sure Phil will talk about that and some other DARE initiatives going forward. Uh, Phil, if it's okay, I'll quickly introduce the two McMaster courses as well. Sure, please do, yeah. Perfect. So you're gonna receive this through your uh, marketing channels or emails as well. Uh, DARE and a number of other associations, OAC, I believe there's some McMaster staff and alumni as well are on this. We're launching two new courses. The first one being uh, Operations Leadership Essentials. That's going to be a single day course held on 30th of January. And that is really focused for that members entering the first level of leadership. Like I just mentioned, all our courses are industry led. We'll be looking at leadership 4.0, coaching, mentorship, uh, constructive conflict management, uh, and operational resilience. And these are all lessons uh, that were highly resonating on the uh, industry operations, leadership and management program we've been running over the last few years with McMaster. I've outlined some of the speakers and panelists that will be joining us. Nancy Barber, just retired CEO of Bombardier. Of course, Dave as well on the call. Uh, Philippa out of East Asia with Volvo UD Trucks. And Michelle, who is just the acting ombuds with US FEMA on the conflict constructive piece. If you're interested in that, uh, the link is dropped in the chat as well. The member associations qualify for the, redu uh, the reduced cost of 500 Canadian plus HST per member. The regular cost is 750. By all means, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're all about en uh, enabling industry businesses and their teams. And the last one is the second course held on the 27th of February. Uh, same thing, full day, uh, 8.30 in the morning to about 4.30 p.m. And we've got a same target audience, but now focusing on those management competencies. So really the function of business unit operations, team and individual performance management, uh, optimizing daily execution, problem solving skills, uh, group-based decision-making, assessing and managing risk, and uh, operational resilience from a management perspective. Shelly Peterson, just with Lockheed Martin Space, and now with Microsoft on the augmented and mixed reality applications within manufacturing. Jamie, Senior Director for the Advanced Weapons Divisions with Northern Drummond and Strategy. So sharing insights on the Armand Combat Aerial Vehicle Program, the F-18 program as well. Julia from East Asia, sorry, from Europe, leading uh, leadership and development and talent development. She was with uh, Volvo, recently moved into Lilium and Air Mobility, uh, was a startup, definitely a medium-sized business as well. We are engaging one more speaker uh, from NASA as well, which was a great win seeing the Artemis program launch recently. So very excited about that too. If you're interested to learn more or uh, the course itself, the link is in the chat. Uh, and this will all be with Dare and you'll see it uh, over the standard channels as well. Uh, but that's uh, really what we're looking at. Uh, on that note, uh, Phil, I'll hand it back over to you. Well, I uh, appreciate that, and I know uh, we've we've gone a little bit over today, and I appreciate everyone's patience and uh, and and for joining us today. Um, it's very excited to see those courses from McMaster, and and knowing that uh, through Dare, uh, there's the, that that uh, that's that special fee uh, that could be accessed. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the ideation phase of, of what the series of events could be uh, to continue this amazing discussion around green manufacturing and diving into some of these very important topics. And so everyone knows we're, we're looking at uh, those series of events to be uh, actually uh, accessible free uh, of charge. And, and so please stay tuned uh, for those. Um, and so with that, uh, from, from DARE's perspective and uh, on behalf of, of DARE and, and McMaster, uh, we wanna thank everyone, especially Dave and Bill uh, for coming and sharing these important insights, you know, looking at, um, you know, this, this holistic approach to green and sustainability in our, in our industry. And of course, focusing on, on new products and, and design concepts, but also the importance of improvements throughout the operations of a, of a company uh, and, and the company's supply chain. So um, I will say, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be sharing some of this information uh, with everyone. Um, DARE also has a few upcoming events. So I ask you to, to take a look at our events page uh, as well. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you, everyone. 
um, will close up today and we appreciate everyone's attention and participation. So thank you very much and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you all.